Hello, good morning everyone and welcome to today's Public Health Voices webinar. I'm Dr Jennifer Hall, I'm a Clinical Associate Professor and Consultant in Public Health Medicine at the UCL EGA Institute for Women's Health and I'm delighted to be hosting today. Public Health Voices is a webinar series open to all which aims to engage with and showcase the importance of interdisciplinarity in public health research and training. In this, the fifth webinar, we are delighted to welcome Professor Joyce Harper. Joyce will talk about her work on women's health and femtech from the menstrual cycle to the menopause. Joyce is a professor of reproductive science at UCL Institute for Women's Health. When Joyce isn't open water swimming, she can be found debunking myths around women's reproductive health on her own podcast, Why Didn't Anyone Tell Me This?, or in any number of other roles, which include head of the Reproductive Science and Society Group, founder of Reproductive Health at Work and the International Reproductive Health Education Collaboration, and co-founder of the UK Fertility Education Initiative. Joyce has worked in the fields of fertility, genetics, reproductive health and women's health for over 30 years and is committed to shining the spotlight on three key stages of women's health, the menstrual cycle, the fertile years and the menopause. Her latest book, Your Fertile Years, was published in 2021. Joyce, thank you so much for joining us today. And I understand you're joining us from a school and perhaps I'm not a perfect connection, though I think we might have sorted that out now. Um, but everyone hopefully bear with us if there are any issues. Um, so, but just before we start and I hand over to you, can I please encourage the audience to submit any questions to the Slido link, which you should uh, be able to see on the slide now. And we'll hold the Q&A session after Joyce's presentation has finished. So thank you very much and over to you, Joyce. Thank you very much, Jenny, and thank you for the invitation. Um, yes, I am in a school. We have been running focus groups on uh, periods, which I'll tell you a little bit about that research um, as we go through. So, yes, we were worried about our first internet connection, but uh, we've run up to another uh, room now. So it might be noisy with pupils running past, but um, hopefully everything will work out OK. So, Jenny, can you see my slide full screen now? Yeah, we can see. Perfect. Perfect. So, yes, hot off the press, actually live in situ in the schools where we're doing some of this really, really interesting work. So it's a, it's a real pleasure to give this talk today. And um, I'll, I'll, without further ado, let's just get started. So, um, so just some disclosures, I do get paid by some companies to give talks and I have formed a few companies myself and I go into uh, corporate, the corporate world and talk about some of the issues I'm going to talk to you about today, especially reproductive health at work. Um, and I've been paid or collaborated with some of these companies on various projects. So what I want to cover today is a little bit about the fertile years. And you'll see here the cover of my book. Um, I started in, in this field in 1987 after I finished my PhD. And I started my career as a clinical embryologist. So I was the person in the fertility clinic who was in the lab, mixing eggs and sperm and making embryos and, and helping people get pregnant. And this is a very, very new field. So the world's first IVF baby, Louise Brown, was born in 1978. So it wasn't even 10 years after her birth. And it was such a privilege to be in this new, exciting and growing field. But as I was learning about fertility, I was really aware that my friends didn't understand and I was learning so many new things. Um, so even doing a biochemistry degree, I didn't understand some of the issues around women's health. And I did start writing a book in 1987, but I was certainly not qualified to, to finish writing the book at that time. And I'm sure those who are a bit older will realize our life goes very quickly. So I roll on to about 2015 and I, really felt uh, a calling as it would be um, to really start working with the public and ensure we teach reproductive health and women's health. So I then started writing the book and uh, it was published a couple of years ago. And since then, I've been doing a lot of work with schools and also with ensuring that we teach adults to teach everyone about uh, reproductive health. So I'm going to talk to you about the school studies that we're doing hot off the press straight after this, I'm going to be doing another focus group with some year 10 girls. And I want to share with you my proposal for the Department for Education of how we need to cope with this in the UK. 
And then I'm, I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about femtech. <clears throat> um, I've been looking at femtech for many years, and I'll explain to you why I've been doing that. I think it's very important for women's education and support. And femtech is health tech. So it's all types, types of new technology, but may, mainly digital technology. But femtech is those that are aimed at women. And I'm going to finish throwing some controversial things out there. What's the future? How is women's health going to be in the future? How are we going to have children in the future? And um, as Jenny said, I started a podcast this year called Why Didn't Anyone Tell Me This? Because I was frustrated that 30, more than 30 years on from when I first wanted to write a book, we still have so many huge gaps in our education about women's health and reproductive health. And I've heard so many members of the public say, well, why didn't anyone tell me X, Y, and Z? So I invite my guests to tell me in their area what issues that they've had come up and what the public tell them that they didn't realize they know, know well, they wish they knew something before. So when I started all this, and you can see the title of my book, it's called Your Fertile Years. And we did always talk about fertility awareness and fertility education. But I, as I've been doing more of this work and as I've been going into schools and delivering these talks, I originally was doing a talk called Fertility Education. And then I've realized over these last few years that it's not just fertility. It's not just about having babies. And these are not just women's issues. So fertility is very much wrapped up with those, those two points. So we've now, I, I now talk about reproductive health education. And we um, set up uh, in 2019, we set up an international group. I was aware that there were so many amazing people worldwide doing fabulous work on reproductive health and fertility education. Um, I wanted to get everyone together. We set up a group and for the first four years, we were called the International Fertility Education Initiative. And then this year I said, we have got to change our name. We've got to change it to reproductive health and be sure that we're not just looking at this as women's issues. And as you'll see, the topics I'm going to talk about are not just issues to do with having a baby. So from puberty to the menopause, this is not the full list, but this is an abbreviated list of the things that I think we need to teach. Puberty, menstrual cycle, endometriosis, contraception, STIs, fertility, pregnancy miscarriage, infertility, menopause, uh, cancers that affect the reproductive system in men and women, and well-being. And it's just amazing that um, sitting here in a school now, I can tell you, and I'll share this data with you, we, we do teach children how not to get pregnant, but we don't teach them about some of the really important issues that they will need to really have a good and healthy life. So I'm going to touch on a few of these. Uh, and let's start with the vulva. <laughs> um, we've just returned from a big uh, 10,000 people com conference on fertility and reproductive health in Copenhagen. And uh, a few of us, a couple of times, just walked around the corridor shouting vulva. You know, it, we don't even have the right language to talk about the female genital system. And it, it's really amazing. So the, the first chapter of my book is explaining female anatomy, ensuring that people know what the clitoris is, where the urethra is, what the, what's the difference between a vagina and a vulva. And it's just amazing that in 2023, we still don't get these words correct. And... In our school study that I'm going to show you in a moment, we asked if the children had learned about puberty and the menstrual cycle, and they pretty much ticked that, as you'll, you'll see from the graph I'm going to share with you. They have learned about these things at school, and that's a great start to that. But these are very much biology uh, topics for sure. They have learned a little bit about the menstrual cycle, but they've, they've only learned about the nuts and bolts. And I always talk about the menstrual cycle as having two key events, about periods and ovulation. But what I've just been discussing with the girls literally uh, an hour ago, um, I really realized that we, we only talk about the negative things of uh, a menstrual cycle and of a period. And the, the girls are using words such as um, a nightmare, terrible, horrific, when they describe having a period. 
And I think one thing we certainly need to change, which I haven't put on the slides because I've just literally been absorbing this from the girls, is that there are positive things about womanhood and about having a menstrual cycle and having a period. And I think we need to start embracing those within schools. So that's something I've added on just today. Um, so in schools, they do teach them that the length of a period is about 28 days. And they say that women ovulate on day 14. I can remember my kids coming back with a little uh, piece of paper with all of this on and very much a diagram like this one on the right about the menstrual cycle. Um, one thing we don't do in schools is we don't teach them what's normal and what's not normal. So they don't know how, how much they can deviate from 28 days. Um, so 21 to 30 de 35 days is actually considered normal, um, but they're not aware of that. They, 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 they haven't been taught what's normal, what's abnormal, what, what's normal pain, what's normal bleeding, that's not being discussed with them in all the discussions we've had. Now, um, quite a few years ago, I became very aware of um, lots of different period tracker apps and fertility apps. And I'm going to share my research with you when I talk about Femtech. Um, but there was one company called Natural Cycles they are a, they actually market themselves as a contraceptive app. And what they do is they want to measure the ovulation of a woman to know when she should avoid having unprotected sex if she is using it as a form of contraception. But obviously you can spin that app around the other way, measure your ovulation to know when would be your fertile window to get pregnant. And I was very interested in, in this app because they were one of the few apps at the time that were actually checking for ovulation. So they use something called basal body temperature and basal body temperature increases very slightly on the day of ovulation. So ovulation is when the egg is released from the ovary and that's, that, that's when the woman could get pregnant. So a lot of these period tracker apps um, just measure date. So the woman just puts in the date she's having her period when she has her next period, she puts in the next date and the algorithm within the app will help her predict her future period. This app was, was doing that, but also measuring this basal body temperature because they wanted to measure ovulation. So I went to them and I said, can we have a look at some of your menstrual cycle characteristics? When I was writing my book, I wanted, I did go and read many of the original studies on various topics that I talked about in the book. And one of them was about the characteristics of the menstrual cycle. And so I was very aware that those studies were done maybe 30, 40 years ago. They were done on very small numbers of women. They had a normal BMI. They were mainly all Caucasian. They were a young age. And that's where we have a lot of our data about the menstrual cycle, 28 days, ovulation day 14. So when we looked at this big data from natural cycles, we looked at over 600,000 menstrual cycles. What we found was that 13% um, of the menstrual cycles in this series was day 28. 65% were days 25 to 30. And then there was very short cycles and very long cycles that came out of that. So it was the first time we could really look at big data and look at a lot of information about women. What was really unexpected was that we found that ovulation was nearer to day 16. And other people have done big data analysis since our publication and found exactly the same data. So that can be tricky if we're trying to look at contraception or trying to get pregnant if we don't quite get the day right that may not always but it may cause issues um, within the, the couple or the woman who's trying to find out this information so for fertility i'm sure you all know that to make a baby we need an egg we need sperm and a womb but some of the interesting facts that people might not be aware of is that women only ovulate one egg per month. And in our whole lifetime, we will ovulate about 500 eggs. We have about 500 menstrual cycles. We don't necessarily always ovulate one. 
and we don't necessarily always ovulate in our in our menstrual cycle so very roughly about 500 men produce about 100 million sperm every time they ejaculate that's that's a pretty average number they normally ejaculate about two mils of sperm there's about 50 million sperm per mil so we have this big discrepancy between uh, the genders we only need one egg and one sperm to make an embryo and then obviously for women we have a womb and that's where the the embryo will implant and the baby will grow Things can go wrong at all of these stages. If we have um, abnormalities and people are trying to get pregnant and they can't, we can use a donor egg, we can use donor sperm, and we can also use a surrogate. Um, there are complications about all of these. It's not that easy. I, I won't go into uh, all of this in this lecture, but there are certainly things that need to be considered, but it's certainly possible. And there are also different types of families. Um, in lockdown, we did a science museum webinar called The Future of Sex. Um, and I talked about different ways that people could create a family. So when I started in this field in the UK, we were not allowed to treat single people or people in a same sex relationship. But now this is very much allowed, uh, not in every country, but is, is in the UK. So single women and same-sex female couples, they will definitely need some sperm. And ideally, in my view, um, I would recommend doing this via a fertility clinic, or they might do it with a friend. Uh, we published a paper on this a few years ago about how some people find a sperm donor online. So even on Facebook, and they're sort of, they're sort of dating sites that um, you can meet someone who will give you some of their sperm but you can imagine the sort of controversies around that. Um, so we, we have gone into that in this paper. Uh, for single men and same-sex male couples, it's a little bit more complicated because they need eggs and they need a womb. And there are different ways of doing this, certainly. Um, again, I won't go into them all, but it, that makes everything a lot more expensive and, and more complicated to do, but it's certainly possible. <clears throat> and fertility, for those who do not align or identify as their sex at birth, again, obviously they need egg, sperm and a womb. And it, this is especially important if they are medically transitioning. So if they're having hormone treatment or if they're having surgery or both, the chances are that these, these treatments will not always, but could make them infertile. So if they have eggs, if they were female at birth, they have eggs, they can freeze their eggs. They may or may not wish to keep having periods. And if they keep their womb, they may or may not wish to become pregnant. It's very, very individual. Um, and if they were, if they have sperm, if they were male at birth, they can certainly freeze their sperm. Um, one thing to note that there are transgender men who have been taking male hormones. Um, there's been a number of reports in the literature where they weren't having a menstrual cycle. So they didn't think they could get pregnant. And then they did unexpectedly get pregnant. So let's go back to this fertile window. So I mentioned about basal body temperature. Um, we can see a sort of average graph here. You can see it slightly goes up on the day of ovulation. Um, the, uh, uh, the way I would normally recommend people to try and check when they're actually ovulating is to use an ovulation stick. It checks for the hormone loosenizing hormone. And it, this rises... Um, it rises about 40 hours before ovulation, but since you only check it once a day, um, we say that anywhere from 20 to 40 hours um, ovulation could happen. Uh, you can also check cervical mucus, a little bit more complicated. Um, we definitely do not recommend that people just check dates. This is uh, really something that estimates, and as we showed with the data from natural cycles, <clears throat> it is really just a very, very rough estimate. But the fertile window is the day of ovulation. So I hope that's not too noisy. <laughs> They're just changing lessons. So they said there'd be a noisy period. So I hope you can still hear me okay. So the day of ovulation, the egg, once it's released from the ovary, it lasts for about, it's viable for about 24 hours. And then the fertile window closes. You can no longer then fertilize the egg. But it starts about five days before ovulation because the sperm can exist in the female genital tract for about five days. So if you're if you're ovulating on day 16, 
you have unprotected sex on day 11, um, you could still get pregnant. There could still be sperm there that could lead to a pregnancy. Now, these next couple of slides are a little bit depressing. Uh, males will produce sperm throughout their whole lives, but the quality of that sperm decreases after age 40. So males over 40 have fewer healthy sperm. They have an increased risk of miscarriage, increased risk of spontaneous mutation, leading to some sorts of abnormalities, and an increased risk of some conditions such as autism. And it can take them longer to get their partner pregnant. And obese or overweight, overweight men have fewer healthy sperm and alcohol and smoking also has an effect. So I think for, for many years, certainly since I've been in this field, we've really concentrated on women and we haven't concentrated enough on men. And I think this has been something really wrong. Um, my next podcast is coming out, uh, I think it's next week, is with Toby Trice, who's a racing driver. He's on, on running a campaign called Racing for Fertility. And he went through, him and his partner went through two rounds of IVF before they realized he had a varicocele, which was easily identifiable on a physical examination. So they went through two rounds of IVF before anyone actually examined Toby, which, you know, it, it takes five minutes for someone to identify a varicocele in, in a man. So, you know, we, we really need to make sure we, we look at the men. Um, when I do this talk in schools, I ask them before I show this slide, if they can name any famous older dads. I think we would find this much easier. We'd say George Clooney, we'd say Mick Jagger. They don't know who those people are. Um, they do say Boris Johnson and uh, Donald Trump. But all, all of these men had one thing in common. They had a much younger female partner. So female fertility has a limited lifespan. We are fertile from puberty to about, it, it does vary. And I think this information really needs to be looked at. We're not sure how many years before the menopause we become infertile. Once we've gone through the menopause, we will have no eggs left, no viable eggs left. So we cannot get pregnant then. Um, the original data said that you lose your fertility about 10 years before the menopause. But there's been many, many people I've spoken to and others who um, have got pregnant um, within a few years of then stopping their periods. But the problem with female fertility is that the quantity and the quality of the eggs decreases. So if we look here, this is a graph of my book. We see this is the age of 35 here. We see female fertility declines and the risk of miscarriage increases. And this is because females are born with all of the eggs we are going to have. We are born with about one to two million potential eggs at birth. By puberty, most of those have died and we've got about 400,000 eggs left, very, very roughly. No one's counting everyone's eggs. Um, and then remember I said we ovulate 500. We have about 500 menstrual cycles. So what happens to all the rest that we didn't ovulate? Well, we lose up to about a thousand eggs each month. Between five hundred and a thousand eggs will just will just die, and we ovulate the one. And as I said, by menopause, all the viable eggs have gone, and the quality of the eggs also decreases as we move away from puberty. The eggs have the chromosomes in the middle of meiosis, uh, which is a very fragile state, so they they can become. Um, uh, very muddled in the in the egg and lead to problems in the embryo and then the child. So we have an increased risk of miscarriage, an increased risk of a chromosomally abnormal child and a decreased chance of even getting pregnant, a decreased chance of conception. Famous older mums, uh, it's a lot more tricky. Um, you'll see that they're all hovering around the age of 50. I've literally just had a message from Sky News wanting to talk to me about Naomi Campbell. Um, I'm assuming she's just had another child. Um, that's a complicated story. One thing in common is probably a lot of these women do not tell their full story and it's their prerogative not to share their fertility story, but they've probably had expensive fertility treatment and some older women around this age will have had egg donation. But not, as I say, it's not something that is often shared by celebrities. And 
This is a very important graph if we look from the OECD data. This is the mean age of women at the first birth of their child. And we can see here the blue bars are where we are now, 2020. The black diamonds are what this was in 1970. You can see pretty low in all of these. And the white diamonds are 2000. So in almost every country over these three time points, the age of first conception has gone up, the first baby has gone up. And this is the age of 30. And here we've got 34. So remember on the previous graph, I, I mentioned age 35. That's the age that we say for the majority of women their fertility is going to decline. Obviously, every woman's individual. You will definitely know someone who got pregnant at 47 um, or 42, whatever. But for most women, their, their fertility starts to decline. And when I first started giving this talk, the graph only went up to age 32, and now it goes up to age 34. So if a woman's having her first child at age 33, 34, she's leaving quite a small window, possibly, to have... Uh, more than one child. So we've looked at women's and men's attitudes to having children. This is work I did with one of my students, Sebastian. Um, we asked women what age, with many things, just a couple of bits of data, what age did they want children? Uh, the main age was, it was, the mean age was 30. I, I thought they were going to say older than this. And we asked them what factors are affecting their decisions. Obviously, career and finances are quite high. But lots of these women were ready to have children now, but they weren't either, either they weren't with a partner or they weren't with a willing partner. So um, that's obviously a, a problem. And this is the work we're doing with Michael Reese and Rena, my PhD student. And we asked men the same questions. Um, they had two peaks, age 30 and 35. And we also asked them the number of children. And most people that we've asked want two to three children. So let's look a little bit about infertility. So I've talked about the fertile window. So most people under the age of 35, for the woman's under the age of 35, they should be pregnant within six months. And infertility is when you've gone for one year and you've not got pregnant. And we also have what we call social infertility. And that's for uh, single people or same sex couples that I mentioned. Um, and for some of the um, trans and gender diverse people, they may not have even tried to get pregnant. Uh, they couldn't get pregnant naturally because between them, they, they haven't got the egg, sperm in the womb. So this we call social infertility. And there's obviously problems when the monthly period keeps coming, there's stress on both partners, and then they may start having fertility tests, and then they need to decide when they want to seek treatment. So the main treatment that they will probably have is in vitro fertilization or IVF, and it comes under the umbrella of assisted reproductive technologies. And this is Louise Brown here. Um, she, as I said, was the first IVF baby born in 1978. And this is some data from the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority who govern fertility treatment in the UK. And we can see that the success of IVF is very related to the age of the patient. So I talked about age 35 before, and what many international groups do that report this data is they collate everyone under 35 together, because whether you're trying to get pregnant at 34 or 28, it's pretty similar by IVF. But then as the woman ages and gets near in the menopause, um, the HPA have done this in two year batches, and we can see the chance of success um, 43 onwards, it's less than 5%, just a few percent. If we use a donor egg, the donors in the UK have to be under the age of 35 for this reason. We can see it's very much uh, a, um, unrelated to the age of the recipient because this is the age of the donor egg is 35 for all of these. So we can see here a couple of women um, who are both pregnant and they're uh, postmenopausal women. Uh, if you use a donor egg in women, there's even been reports in women in their 70s and 80s have used a donor egg and their womb has stayed fertile. So is egg freezing the answer? Um, I'm asked this question all the time. Um, it is a possibility. We were discussing at our big conference this week 
Um, if we were looking at the HFEA data, we wanted to know it by age, that the, the rate of egg freezing in almost every country is really increasing. It was a technique that was very difficult to do until about 15 years ago. Uh, the eggs are very big cell and it was hard technically to freeze it. Um, so it's possible to do. We did have a regulation in the UK that you could only keep your eggs for 10 years. Uh, that's now been overturned. So now you can keep them uh, for uh, added on numbers of 10 years, depending on your situation. So I just am nervous now uh, about students at graduation or early in their career, in their early 20s, deciding, OK, I want kids, but I'm not even going to think about it yet. I'm just going to go and freeze my eggs. And, and a growing number of companies are using this as a company perk and delaying this uh, for women. Um, that, that makes many of us nervous. Um, it's an expensive treatment. You need multiple rounds of, of this treatment. It's certainly no guarantee. And other countries also have regulations. So I always talk about egg freezing as um, plan B, not plan A. So plan B would be maybe you get to uh, 30, 31, and you're not in the right <coughs> situation, then you might want to freeze your eggs. Uh, but doing this sort of early in your career, I, I, it makes me personally feel uncomfortable. And I want to turn now to the menopause. Um, I've been doing a lot of research in the menopause. The three papers on the left here are a big survey we did a couple of years ago, asking women over 40 how they felt about the menopause and what they knew about it. And all three of these papers are now published. We separated perimenopause, postmenopause, and then compared three groups. And then we also asked women under 40, what do you know and feel about the menopause? So I'm gonna share some of this data with you. We've got a study on uh, specifically for black women because they don't often fill in these surveys. We specifically targeted them. We've got about 500 women who we're analyzing at the moment. And um, as Jenny said, I'm a cold water swimmer. Many, many women who cold water swim are um, around um, sort of 40 onwards. And so we asked them, how they felt cold water swimming affected their menstrual and menopause symptoms. And I can tell you it's good news. <laughs> um, so this is a really important graph. Most women think, well, most doctors as well think, oh, women go through the menopause at uh, 51. That's the average age. So women who are 42, 43, often if you say to them, we think you might be perimenopausal, they say, no, 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 I'm too young. And the doctors sometimes say, no, they're too young. Go away, come back when you're 50. So this graph shows the average age women go through the menopause. And the menopause is a period in time when you realize that it's been a year since you've had your period. So once you've realized that, then you become post-menopause. And before that, you're counted as perimenopause. So it's a sort of retrospective date, which it makes things a bit, a bit difficult. So if you look here, I, I always say women will go through the menopause, have their last period between ages 45 and 55. And these perimenopausal symptoms I'm going to talk about, they start about 10, they can start up to 10 years before that. So having perimenopausal symptoms in your late 30s or even mid 30s is very, very possible. So we must be aware there's certain education things that are really, really important in this. So this is some of our data. We asked women, how informed about the menopause did you feel before the age of 40? Because I feel by 40, they really need to know this so that they can understand if this is happening to them and they can join the dots. So we said, how did you feel? And they said, most of them, as you say, not informed at all or some knowledge. I want this to be that everyone ticks very informed in both of these I think this education is absolutely essential. We cannot have women entering this life stage not understanding what's going to happen to them. So um, we did, a, uh, this is the perimenopause survey that I did with uh, my student Sam. And we did controversially put a very long list of possible menopause symptoms. We didn't say they were definite, we said possible, but we wanted to know what they associated with the menopause and perimenopause. And this is the most common, don't worry about this graph, I know you can't read it, irritability, poor concentration, poor memory, brain fog, low mood, all of these are psychological issues 
that women say report. And then we've got things like hot flushes, night sweats, which we all know, probably know about, but these are not so much talked about. And we asked them to tell us more about how they felt. They said they've got a lack of education, no idea about the symptoms or how it's impacted their lives. Problems with their GP, again, GP training can be very, very limited on the menopause. And so they, they don't understand it, so they don't support them. And they said they felt stigma, taboo and forgotten. So um, I'm doing some work now with my colleague Shima Tarek. Um, I'm not, not, we're not announcing it yet, but just to let you know, watch this space. In August or September, we will be um, revealing a fantastic project with UCL and the main partners around this area for education and support of women at this time of their lives. So something very exciting happening. So post-menopause, I think this is the light at the end of the tunnel. This is fantastic, freedom, liberating. If you want to see a great comedy about this, watch The Change on Channel 4. There are some absolutely brilliant lines about perimenopause and postmenopause that I absolutely loved. It's celebration because there's no more cycling hormones, no more menstrual cycle, no more periods, no more PMS, no more need for contraception. And there's many of us trying to talk about the positive aspects of postmenopause. For many women, it's a most liberating and incredibly productive time of their life. And these are, these are photos of us swimming. I personally feel that the menstrual cycle with these hormones oscillating, powerful sex hormones oscillating around our body every month. You know, the girls have just told me that they, one girl said, I only feel good about two days a month because our hormones are all over the place. This is what it's like. It's like being in a turbulent sea. This is how I would describe postmenopause on the right. Postmenopause is calm. You wake up feeling the same every day. You're not hormonal. It's a time for celebration, for sure. And looking after our reproductive health, I always talk about the four pillars of well-being. These are important for not just our reproductive health, but for dementia risk, cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, everything. We need to look after our nutrition, our exercise, our sleep, and our mental health. So this is our International Reproductive Health Education Collaboration. Apologies for the very long name. We abbreviate it to IREC. Um, we are doing a huge amount of work to make sure that we can educate people on this. There are so many great people globally working on these topics and I'm so privileged that they've joined us in this group. We've talked about language as our most recent paper is about the importance of getting language right and not offending people. Um, and so I wanted to share with you some work I'm doing in schools as I am now. Um, I went to my local school with my list of topics that I thought we should be teaching and I found out that these are not taught in biology. They're taught in uh, PSHG, which is the sex and health uh, education. And so um, uh, one of my uh, team, Catherine, uh, looked at the English and UK curriculum. And she's uh, this paper has just come, come out last week and uh, this week. Sorry. And we looked at the gaps in that knowledge. And it is now since 2019 in the UK curriculum, in the PSHG curriculum, that we have to teach, this is from the Department for Education, the facts about reproductive health, including fertility and the potential impact of lifestyle on fertility for men and women and menopause. So we um, did a school survey. This is what I mentioned at the beginning. Both of these papers have been submitted. They've got a lot of data in them. And this is the graph I was referring to. The blue is what they've learned in school and the orange is what they're learning outside school. So the first four are pretty much covered. I want to see this whole graph to be totally blue, every blue to be 90, 100%. If we look at menopause, just over 10% have learned about the menopause and endometriosis and PCOS is unacceptable. Just a few percent of pupils have learned about these important topics. No wonder the diagnosis of these disorders take years to do when the girls are, and are not taught about these and are not taught what is normal. Uh, with the girls, we were just talking about TikTok 
uh, a lot of these orange lines will be things they've learned on TikTok. And um, yeah, well, we could debate that. <laughs> I don't think that's the way we should be teaching them. So I, I've asked when I go into schools, I've asked the girls, do you have any issues with your periods? And I got these sorts of responses. I mean, this is heartbreaking. I've, I've really had to try and hold it together and not cry. So this is what we're doing today. Um, we're doing focus groups in schools. And I, I've, what we found is that the teachers have not really been teaching it. Um, it's, if it is taught, it might be taught by their form tutor. And um, so first of all, the girls have said, can the teachers be taught how to support those having periods during their teacher training? Certainly in every school we've been in, the toilets are not fit for purpose. They lock them, they're, they're, they're just not fit. They, and they have the same amount of girls as boys toilet, toilets, which just doesn't work. And some do have access to period products. One of the biggest problems, they are not allowed to leave the lessons. It's very unusual for a teacher to let them leave. Some of them leak. Um, some of them have really bad cramps. That, that, this, that's not acceptable. Overall, my proposal to the Department for Education, they absolutely 100% want to be taught all of this with the boys in the room, not by their form teacher. And I also think not by people like me or any other group going into the school, they should be taught by the teachers. So the teachers say these words to them and they can get support from the teachers for um, if they've got any issues with these. So the international group, we've developed a, a guide for teachers. Um, it's a big PowerPoint and a big word file. And we're now piloting this in some schools around the world to work with teachers more to look at how we can help them deliver this. So to finish off, I just want to talk now about Femtech just for a few minutes. As I mentioned, they uh, are mainly period tracker apps and fertility apps, and they can definitely support and educate women. So this is some of the research that I've been doing. I'm, I'm not going to go into this at all. Um, all of these papers are open access. So we've looked at fertility apps and pregnant and uh, period tracker apps in quite detail. But I just wanted to say I've been to a number of... Um, sessions on Femtech, many, many sessions on Femtech, and hear lots of pictures about this new technology. And my interest in new technology came back in um, th literally 30 years ago. Working in the fertility field, there is always new technology being brought into fertility treatment. And these are often called IVF add-ons. And I first published about this in 2010. I've been part of the HFEA and also the ESHRA group that have written the guidelines about the use of this technology and how we need to practice evidence-based medicine. And now I'm seeing exactly the same happening in the femtech arena. I'm hearing more and more people with startups, they've got lot, millions of funding and they're developing technology that to me doesn't even make sense. I, I don't understand what they're trying to do or what they're trying to do is not currently possible. And so I think we are in the same issue as we are with IVF add-ons, we're getting technology being sold to, to women that is not evidence-based, is just leading to confusion um, rather than, you know, lots of them are marketed as empowerment. And I, I don't think it's empowerment if it's a technology that doesn't actually work. Um, and I, I always mention Elizabeth Holmes, some of you may know, she developed some amazing sounding tech um, uh, well, not quite a long time ago that she said every pe people could have in their house a machine that could test for lots of diseases. Great idea, great pitch, but it didn't work. And she's now in prison. And I've just watched the documentary about the Korean scientist who said he'd done human uh, cloning. And um, he's uh, there's a there's a series on Netflix, uh, an episode on Netflix called King of Clones. So again, watch that. Scientists do sometimes bring technology in that's financially beneficial uh, before the mechanisms actually worked out. So to conclude, how will we make our future children? Well, we've got here frozen eggs. If we've got more women freezing their eggs, will we have more? This is about genetic testing, something I worked on for about 20 years. Um, people are talking about making stem cell, making stem cells into eggs. Everything I said about female fertility decline wouldn't, wouldn't matter if we could make um, more eggs. 
We've got genome editing. I was on the Nuffield Council for Bioethics Genome Editing Group. We wrote a report about genome editing. Uh, this is Matt Brandstrom on my podcast. He's the world leader in womb transplants. And we could maybe have artificial incubators. And this lady has a product called Bolly, uh, not a product yet, <laughs> an idea, which she said, if you have a premature baby, you could, uh, in her system, uh, carry this baby yourself. You could strap it in a strap-on incubator. And then we've got things like the handmaid's tail. We've got a number of growing number of celebrities who don't want to carry their own child for various reasons. And it just makes me feel a little bit of like the handmaid's tale. So is our future utopia or dystopia? I don't know. If you haven't watched Gattaca, please watch that. It's a movie very old, but it's really happening. Brave New World, written a hundred years ago. The, the main character is an embryologist. No more families, no more pregnancy. Um, my students told me their favorite lecture on our MSc program was on, uh, was on transhumanism. I got David Wood, who's the lead of the UK Transhumanist, to come and give a talk. If you haven't heard this term, listen to David. He'll be on my podcast in the summer. And then this is about the future. Will, will we in the future be genetically engineering our children? So I think we need to educate everyone. We need to radically change education in the UK. Social media does happen. We, I think we need to think about how we can use it. I think femtech needs to be evidence-based and we need to think about the ethics. And that's my wonderful team who have helped with all various aspects of this. And thank you to all of them. And that's my social media uh, links. So Jenny, I will stop. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for that, Joyce. You have covered a huge amount there. Um, lots of really interesting work and topics that I think are really relevant to everyone. Um, so as someone also working in this area, I completely agree that it is vital we talk about reproductive health as a whole, not just pick bits of as aspects of it, whether it's contraception or fertility, and that it's important to ed educate everyone in early and you know, school is the obvious place for that. But if I may play devil's advocate for the purpose of the webinar today, um, the school curricula are overfull and teachers are not necessarily the right people to be teaching these things. So I wonder what the case is for schools to teach on those specific conditions you mentioned, like endometriosis and polycystic ovaries, and not, for example, diabetes or dementia, which you know, are much more common. And that links to some of the questions that we've got in our Slido about how do we, uh, how do you suggest that men are more educated on women's health? I don't think they're aware of the difficulties that women face and how schools can improve education on conditions such as endometriosis. Yeah, I, I perfectly understand that there are lots of diseases we need to teach about. I, I really think, um, having been working on this now for, you know, coming up to 10 years, I really think that the teachers need to talk. I don't think we need to tell them everything. They don't, they don't need to tell the students everything about endometriosis or everything about PCOS, but it doesn't take long to explain the characteristics. I mean, in our, in our teacher's guide, we've got one slide on each. Um, we maybe need a bit more. But what we are doing in the international group is we are making um, patient information leaflets about each of these. So what I want the schools is just to flag it up in one slide um, and then have a link to our international website so that the students can go and read more if they want to. So yeah, even with one in 10, it's not going to affect everybody. Um, but I've certainly listened to some girls that you know their their period is really really affecting their well-being i'm pretty sure they probably got endometriosis or need to certainly get started to be checked and some of them have been diagnosed but some of them are being brushed off so these are things that affect them now they're not things that are going to affect them in 10 or 20 years they're things that are affecting them now and women are putting up with this for too long on our, our we did a perimenopause focus group last night one of the women said um, she was only diagnosed, she had a long history of how she was diagnosed with endometriosis and only finally diagnosed when she was having a child. So I think that needs to change. And we need to teach the men. The men need to be in the room from, you know, when, when they're eight years old and they do sex ed, they need to be in the room. Okay, lovely. All right. Um, look through some of the other questions. Um, there's a, a general question about whether there has been an increase in the amount of money going towards research in women's health recently. Is that something that you've seen? Um, I, I'm not sure. Um, I hope so. Um, 
I interviewed on my podcast, Marika Big, who's written a book called This Won't Hurt about, uh, it's mainly about sexy science and the fact that women's health research, um, she goes through all the examples about how we didn't even understand cardiovascular disease in a woman. Um, we didn't even understand the clitoris, <laughs> uh, you know, because no one did research on women at all. So certainly there is much, much more research being done on women. So yes, I think the, the money is following. And I think now this is becoming sexy science. Menopause for sure is sexy science at the moment. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone wants to find a solution. Um, so we're go hoping we're going to be successful with our grant applications. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so it's certainly much more studies being done. And so I'm assuming that <clears throat> much more is getting funded. Um, and as a sort of slightly related question, do you think some of the issues around femtech not being evidence based or effective are because that sector tends to be male dominated? I uh, wonder, no, is, are they are they female entrepreneurs developing the femtech or are they? Yeah. They're mainly female. Um, we were at an event a couple of weeks ago and there were 13 pitches to the to the it was a big conference. Um, there were none that were only men. Um, there was some that was a man and a woman, um, but uh, most of them do have men somewhere involved. Um, but yeah, there was a woman on each of them. But you know that I, I felt I shouldn't keep asking the same question. But the first one was about a certain product that they said was going to help menopause symptoms, and so you know, and she made very bold claims. So I said, "Where's have you done some evidence? Yeah, where's your evidence for saying that these claims are because they've." They're using your product. And, uh, you know, this, I hear it the same thing. I oh, know we haven't done that. <laughs> um, so I don't think that's fair. If you're saying this product is going to help relieve your menopause symptoms and you haven't done any studies at all to validate that, I think that's unfair. And that's not empowering women. That's in So my statement is it's not empowering women. It's exploiting women. And I've seen that for decades in the IVF arena. And I don't want to see it anymore. Yeah, we've got a related question. What's your view on companies testing hormones? Specific company mentioned, but I won't. Um, to guide women's reproductive decisions. Sound great, but any downsides? Read, read what I wrote in my book. I was very careful what I wrote in my book. Um, when you're going through IVF treatment, we need to decide how much drugs to give a woman. And we do measure their hormones so we know how they're responding. But hormones change every day. And so if you measure your hormones on one day, then you measure them a week later, they're going to say different things. So I think we're at an early stage with what measuring hormones in a 25 year old will tell us. But we know, for example, um, that measuring uh, one of the common ones, AMH, um, the, I've, I've looked at all the data again and again. And obviously, as a scientist, data changes and then you will change your mind about something as new data comes on. Mm -hmm. But when I wrote the book and at the current time, everything I've read and, and my friend Karen Hammerberg, who's the co-chair of the International Fertility Education, she wrote a piece in the conversation, I think it was last week or the week before, saying that she didn't think it was valid. Um, and the, th the thing is, if you have a bad AMH, you can still get pregnant. It doesn't stop you getting pregnant. So if you say that to a woman she's got a bad AMH, you give her huge anxiety when she could still get pregnant. And if she's got a good AMH, and she's 32, what would you say? Would you say, oh, it's fine. Don't worry about having kids for three years, you know, five years. I mean, we don't have any data on that. And mm -hmm. I think we're risking leading to uh, anxiety and stress in women for mm -hmm. something we really don't know enough about. I wish we did, but at this moment in time, yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing more data. So just singly measuring hormones is very limited. Doing more than that, looking at characteristics of their menstrual cycle, um, you know, finding out about their well-being, et cetera, finding out the age their mother went through the menopause, all those sorts of things can certainly add. And that's why it's important to pe for people to understand what's normal and what's not mm. normal. Sure. Mm. There was something that really struck with me at the um, screening that we went to uh, back in February about the, the egg freezing documentary, where um, those companies offer free tests beforehand um and you know if your level is low it's like oh well this is the best it's ever going to be so you you need to freeze your eggs now and if your level is high it's like great you've got loads of eggs you should freeze them now You're like oh like you know the corporate and money making uh thinking that's going on behind it of that you know 
whichever option it always leads to freezing your eggs <laughs> exactly if you do have a test the test decision has got to be different depending on the results if it's the same then don't do the test just tell them to freeze their eggs at the beginning <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, excuse me. Um, a couple of questions about your opinion on the social and mental effect of the idea that fertility and reproduction has been focused on as a woman's health issue rather than both sexes. So, how do we feel similarly about the term that women's health is generally used to describe reproduction, even if I think people are trying to move away from that? So, for example, the women's health strategy isn't just about reproduction, like it has cardiovascular disease and, and other things in there, but still women's health seems to end up being a shorthand for fertility, reproduction. Yeah, I, um, I've, I've tried to listen to men's views on this a lot over the years. Um, and having listened to them, they want to be heard. You know, where, where there's a brilliant article for Foster, who's um, him and his part, his, his wife have had, I think three miscarriages and he, he's an artist and he's done some great work about, you know, his, the miscarriages. And he, he talks very beautifully about um, his feelings and well, not beautifully, I wouldn't say beautifully, you know, very openly about his feelings. You know, they, they were his losses too, but people often in a very, very negative situation, don't think about the men. They don't think about when the, woman has another period when they're trying to get pregnant it's the man's loss too so I I think we're doing men a huge injustice by not giving them support and education on these topics and you know just talking about periods the girls are saying to me the guys that know about them are great you know they they're they're fabulous one of them said there's some twins and one's a boy one's a girl and the boy carries around period products in his bag and gives them to all the girls and you, you know we, we are at a pivotal stage where we have to readdress this and not, they're not all women's issues. Not everything's our fault. <laughs> um, and we need to, to, to really um, educate properly. Mm. And, you know, the girls hate being separated. They said it's stigmatizing. It's making them look from age eight. The boys then think the girls are weird and have this odd thing that happens to them. So it's all their thing. And, mm. and they, they've missed out on all this. Embrace mm. it. It's life, you know. Mm. So, yeah, I think the, the period products thing. I was in Scotland last week for a conference, and you know they have period products free everywhere in the yeah. airport toilets in their schools. Um, and period poverty is isn't it a real issue um, in in our country. I mean, we've got a question here about what can we do for the the reproductive rights of. Um, people in in lower middle income countries um as well as so, you know have any thoughts on that yeah in, in our international group we're trying to get more low middle middle, middle income countries uh, involved you know i i can't even imagine I, I think we're such a mess in the uk you know we're we're starting from even a much more difficult situation in these mm -hmm. countries mm -hmm. so we we are going to try and tackle it and everything we do will be trying to give support and education Great, thank you. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time for our webinar today. So thank you again, Joyce, so much for your time and for sharing all that amazing work that you're doing. Uh, we hope you found that useful and thank you everyone for joining. Bye. Thank you, bye.